Next on the Broadway show, it's a disarming charm of Broadway's Harry Potter, Steve Haggard. Plus, Betty Who, now on Broadway in Hadestown. And a chat with the director of Kimberly Akimbo. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is the Broadway show. So glad you're with us for this latest edition of the Broadway show. It's going to be a good one. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Sure, the child is cursed, but the story? Well, it is pure magic. I sat down with the actor who plays grown-up Harry Potter, Steve Haggard. Well, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. Well, so I have to ask you, you are a newbie to New York. How, how has it been treating you? It's a little bit different than what we were used to. It's great. I, you know, I have been uh, falling in love with it. Chicago was like my home mm -hmm. and my heart for a long time. I'm just surprised that I feel so at home in New York. There's always a changing, there's always a going and um, a movement about New York that I've never been any place like it. So. I, I couldn't agree more Listen with you. Listen to me, I'm such a tourist. I, you know, I love it. <laughs> I want to take you on the big red bus or whatever that is. <laughs> Show me New York. <laughs> and I get to go to work every day and be Harry Potter, so that helps. Yeah, that's that's not a bad gig, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> well, talk about how that happened, because originally you were um, Harry and Draco, correct? Sure. And how long did that last before you got the... Well, I was the understudy for Harry and Draco, and so I was able to do uh, Harry a couple times in the two-part and Draco, which was a lot of fun to be yeah. able to sort of um, do the different versions of that. And then after uh, the shutdown, we came back and I opened the show uh, as Harry. They asked me to be Harry. And I said, yes. <laughs> I think I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Let me think about it. <laughs> One of my favorite things about doing the show is getting to see people experience the Wizarding World in a different way. So like maybe they've read the books or they've seen a movie or two or all of them if you're me, and they come in, they step into this theater, the Lyric Theater, and from the get-go, you're in a world in which magic exists, in which magic is a, just a given. To be able to experience that every day, new with a, a new audience is, um, that's really a joy. I think what's exciting is people, so many people, I think myself included, waited so long to dive into that world, right? Like we imagined it in our heads, we saw it in a movie, but it wasn't really tangible. And I think the theater, the, the show makes it feel tangible, right? One of my favorite things is to hear um, kids who come see yeah. it and I'll do an illusion. We rehearse these illusions for months. We, you know, we're very precise about them because they, they are happening. Mm -hmm. Every, every time right in front of the audience. And they have to be very precise to work. Hearing the kids in the audience go, ah, <laughs> like, what? <laughs> so, so, and the adults, by yeah, the way. Well, that, that too. I had a friend who came to see it. They kept being like, how do you do that? How, how, are you, how does this work? How does this work? And at some point uh, over the course of the show, they were just like, they were just like, I give up, I give over. I don't know, I don't know how it works, I don't know. You really are magical. <laughs> yeah. But it's, I think that energy is what makes the job such a, a pleasure to do. Because you remember like, oh, someone's experiencing the wizarding yeah. world for the first time tonight. I love the fact that the Potterheads are all different ages. I mean, everyone came to this at a different time. It wasn't that it came out, everybody read. It's, you know, you've got an 11 year old sitting next to a 50 year old and yeah. they've either read the book or watched a movie and they're all, you know, equally just enchanted enchanted by it. I don't think you have that very often with shows. No, no, I've done a lot of plays and you don't, you, you, it's a, it's a luxury and it's also a responsibility to, to portray these characters that um, so many people have grown up with or have, um, have a relationship with. Let's talk about how you got started in, in theater and acting. Um, you've had a lot of different jobs, I, I understand, from Chicago, right? Oh, sure. I've had a lot of different jobs outside of theater, right. too. But... What did you have? Oh, man, I had some weird jobs. I moved libraries. What does that mean? I, did you know that libraries have to move from time to time? <laughs> So I, they, you like, I don't know, I, it was me no, and like. A the, lot of library? I don't know. You well, move like books? like colleges. Yeah, you move books, you go and you move books, you put them on a truck. 
you know, move the furniture around. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, you have okay. to make a living. I was a waiter. I'm a terrible waiter. You are? Why? Yes. Uh, you can't remember? How could you not remember orders? You remember lines all night long. I got so I get so stressed out. I got stressed out. I once dumped a tray full of... Uh, I got fired this night, but I dumped a tray full of ice water down this lady's backless dress. <laughs> it was terrible. My manager was like, um, Steve, can we have a conversation? And then we both mutually agreed that it was not the best job for me. So it wasn't a firing. <laughs> it, was a, it was a negotiation. Yeah, we worked we, it out. We, <laughs> I was like, you're right, I'm terrible. Now, how did you first get involved in theater? Did you say, like, this is always what I wanted to do? Did you, what, uh, was it a? No, I got cut from the baseball team. What do you mean? You got cut from the baseball team, so you just had to do theater? Yeah. <laughs> my mom was like, <laughs> I was like, you got to get out of the house. And so my mom encouraged me to do uh, theater. My high school ended up having this amazing theater program. And my friend sort of tricked me into auditioning for the director. I did a bunch of like impressions, I guess, when I was younger. Um, what, what, of people? Of people, I thought. Can I know, see one? Absolutely or two? not. Why? You do magic every night. <laughs> well, Just said, one. No, no, I, I, no, it's funny. I think I was really, well, I don't know if I was good at it. When I was <laughs> Somebody 16. thought you were good at Somebody it. Somebody did. And they, they sort of, um, they surrounded me um, and wouldn't let me go until I did it for the director. And the director was like, You're you in. Should in a, you should be you in shouldn't a play. play baseball. You should be in a play, kid. We're taking a look at another one of the amazing shows soon to be headed to Broadway. The musical adaptation of Nicholas Sparks' The Notebook is Broadway bound. It features music and lyrics by singer songwriter Ingrid Michaelson. If this is love, maybe I'm ready. How do I know? I'm in my head again If this is love I think I'm in it If this is, if this is If this is love Before officially opening on Broadway though, we got to know the stars. It's a love story, which is sort of oversaid maybe, but um... Universal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it could really kind of like in the way that it's cast that there are so many different kinds of bodies and the way they look on stage mm -hmm. that it could really be anybody. Mm -hmm. It could, it's not in any specific time period or place and mm -hmm. people can identify themselves with whoever's on stage at whatever point. It can be a mirror in a way mm -hmm. and you feel seen for seeing how hard love can be, how hard life can be. You see Allie makes some poor decisions in the show like she does in the book and the movie and feels seen that not everybody's perfect. This person that deserves love and is going after what she believes in still can make mistakes along the way. And I think that translates to audience as well because there's never a dry eye. It hurts so good. It's become the, the title that it is because it is so human and there is pain in humanity, but there is also growth and inspiration and hope. The first word that comes to my mind when I think about the show is timeless. Watching the just relentless commitment that Ali and Noah have to each other is just like so appealing and and refreshing too, you know, to see people just go for it. It's not saccharine, it's not schmaltzy, it's about the essence of everything. The movie was so wonderful, and this musical is at another level because of this gorgeous music. If you're a human being, you're gonna, you're gonna connect to this. If this is love, I'm not ready. If this is love, why am I so unsteady? If this is love. I mean, musicals are supposed to sort of embody like an emotion musically, right? Like we have these really strong book scenes in the show and then it's supposed to sort of ideally like explode in the emotional moments with music. And I think Ingrid, um, even down to the orchestrations, right? I mean, like everything is so lush like the sound is feels like lavish almost really like woodwind heavy and string heavy and stuff it sounds almost i joke like a cartoon like it sort of just like comes alive and and is colorful Fairy in the tale. sound yeah this is a broadway show and we're back in just a few
Australian pop star Betty Who just recently made their Broadway debut in the Tony Award winning musical Hades Town. Paul's here now with a story. That's right, Tamsin. Pop music sensation Betty Who has taken on the role of Persephone in the Tony winning hit. We met up right here at the Broadway home of Hades Town, the Walter Kerr Theater. Betty, welcome to Broadway. Look, this is your Broadway home, the Walter Kerr. Can you believe? Everyone is moved watching this show because it's a beautiful show and it's now in its fifth year on Isn't Broadway. Crazy? I, I mean, know it's crossed, a pandemic it's in crossed there. into the one of the um, into the hundred longest running shows oh, wow. of all time cool. in Broadway. Which cool. feels crazy because it doesn't feel like it's been twenty nineteen was ten seconds ago, but were you like, if I'm gonna do a Broadway show, it has to be one of the top one hundred shows. I'm gonna wait. Let me yeah. wait, wait until I have it crosses. Standards, no. No, <laughs> I'm honestly I, I coming into this world, you know, I, I've been saying for a couple of years, trying to take meetings and meet people and kind of get the word out that I'm a theater kid at heart and that this is somewhere I'd really love to work. And I did feel a little bit like I'll take what I can get about it. So the fact that I'm playing like an incredible role in one of the best Broadway shows of all time is like icing on the cake because I just wanted the cake in the first place. I just wanted to do Broadway, whatever it was. And so to be here is like more than I could have possibly imagined. So tell me about that. I didn't know you were really a theater yeah. kid. Um, it's not information that's readily sure. available. So talk about that. As a kid, I think that we often, you know, obviously have a ton of different experiences and sort of um, loves, and there's only so much time and extracurricular that you can really participate in. And so I found that music took over my life in, by choice, mm -hmm. um, but it meant that I didn't get to spend as much time as a kid doing stuff that I also really loved, and theater was one of them. And so, like, I was a cello player throughout my whole sort of childhood and went to performing arts high school for cello. Mm. But I was jealous of the theater kids the whole time. They did Susicle at, at my high school and I was like furious that I wasn't in it. I didn't I didn't want to be in the pit. I wanted to be on stage. Uh -huh. And so now to have spent 10 years writing music, performing, you know, on tour and all of that, I think that when it really comes down to it, my love of performing is what lights me up. Me being live in a room with people, changing people in the room. Mm is what makes me feel like I'm making a difference, is what makes it feel like it's meaningful to me. The fact that I get to be here and doing a show that I, I believe in so much. A friend of mine was like, if you're gonna do Broadway, you better love the show, because mm. you're gonna do it eight times a week. And I feel really lucky that this is the one I'm in, because I, I do, capital L, love it. Well, you actually get to start the show watching, you're observing at first, you have a great entrance. Yeah. You're, you're sort of sitting up there with Hades, the, yeah. the fantastic Philip Boykin. Yeah. And then you get a great entrance and you're a party girl. Yeah. Persephone's coming down to party. I mean, she's living she it up on this. top. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Which I think is kind of parallel to what people say about you as a pop personality. Yeah. People love your shows and people have such a connection to what you do to audiences. How excited are you to welcome them to Broadway to see you yeah. in the show? I mean, it feels, really special. I think I've always felt a little bit like an underdog, sort of culty, if you know, you know. Right. Because um, a lot of people don't know. And so if you do know, you're like, oh wait, like we're in the same secret right. club <laughs> that we like, we know and we're excited about this thing. It's exciting to see Betty Who fans come in and see me do something totally different. It's kind of vulnerable actually, because I think I expect them to come in and expect to see Betty and I'm not. I'm sure. trying to be Persephone and, and that is kind of, it's weird to see people wearing the Betty Who shirts in the audience, because I'm like, I'm i am not gonna sing Somebody Loves You For You, do you know what I mean? It's, we're gonna have a different experience tonight. But I think I'm also really excited to be in front of new people who have never heard of me. The other side of the cult that have been like, who's this? And have this be the first introduction of me to them, because I think it's so different from what I have done and normally do, but I'm bringing just as much rigor and, and trying to bring as much life to this performance as I possibly can and make this goddess actually really human. She has fun, but she also really, she really goes through it and she is feeling real pain caused by this person who she really loves. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I feel just really honored. Hi, I'm Nathan Lane and you're watching The Broadway Show. And aren't you lucky? Welcome back to The Broadway Show. I'm Tamsin Fidel, so let's get back to it. It's one for the ages, the critically acclaimed Broadway musical, Kimberly Akimbo. It's a story of a 16-year-old girl who has a rare and fictional rapid aging disease. Imagine teen angst while living in the body of a 70-year-old woman while also dealing with a dysfunctional family. Here's Beth Stevens with another edition of Building Broadway. 
So you were a performer on Broadway for a long time. Was directing always a dream for you? I think I probably was all along because I was so interested even as an actor in things that had nothing to do with me. I was really interested in the larger parts of storytelling. Um, but I didn't really take the leap until about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. That's how it started. So what was the learning curve for directing? I mean, I know that as an actor, you get to see a lot of different styles of directing. But when when were you like, oh, I can I can do that. I know how to do that. I had, in, in years previous to that, whenever I had downtime, you know, and there's quite a bit of it as an actor, I would ask friends who were directors if I could assist them. You know, when you're in front of the rehearsal table acting, it's actually that hard. And it's very hard to see the forest for the trees. And then you are three feet on the other side of the table watching it and the clouds part and it seems so, um, seems so easy. The solution seems so easy. And so it's an interesting thing to know, to have been on both sides, um, that it can be that easy and it is actually that hard. So let's talk about Kimberly Akimbo. This is your first directing credit on Broadway, and congratulations on your Tony nomination. Yeah, thank you. What was your way into Kimberly Akimbo? Well, with a new show, it has to be the writers, no matter what. And so the thing I cared most about was uh, that David and Janine felt that their baby was in good hands. So it was really important to me um, to be right next to David and Janine, to really hear uh, what their goals were and what what was most important to them in any given moment. So I spoke with David Lindsay Abair and Janine Tesori, and this, of course, is based on David's play that was produced off-Broadway, and Janine thought it could sing. When you first saw the script, did you think, oh yeah, this is a perfect musical? Yes. Oh. I, I, well, I first spoke with David about it. Um, before I was on board, we were talking about, a, I was directing a play of his in Boston, and um, and so we were discussing that, and he had mentioned that um, that he was going to be he was working on Act One of this musical adaptation of Kimberly Akimbo, and I gasped and I thought, oh wow, that's an amazing idea. That play really sings. And so when it came around about a year later, I was really excited and then really delighted to hear the score because in fact, and I think David has said this. Um, it really has deepened the play because you have insight into the character's subtext that you don't have in the play. And so I think it's actually made the story deeper and richer and better. So for people who don't know, this musical is about a, a teenage girl who appears to be much, much older. But there's also this aspect of it where everyone is just a little quirky, a little off. So tell me about finding the sort of the humanity and the realness in those very quirky, very funny characters. Well, I think the challenge with this play is they're, they're very funny and, and they could be very broad. Um, and it was really important to us, particularly with the parents and with Aunt Deborah, that, um, that we're not just looking at villains because they actually, um, they love Kim deeply, but they're bad at it. <laughs> and I think we know a lot of people like that, who the, the intent is right, but um, the execution and the impact is all wrong. And so um, I think you can't, if you just have sort of arch villains or sort of broad characters that aren't based in truth or based in any of the details from our own lives, um, I think it's hard to connect. So it was really, really important to, um, to make sure that as absurd as the story can sometimes be and as absurd as the situation is and as um, the circumstances are, that there isn't a single moment that someone can't say, that actually reminds me of a, a slice of my own life. The search for the Holy Grail is going strong on Broadway, and in honor of the revival of Spamalot, we've got a new vlog over at Broadway.com. It's called The Weekly Grail, hosted by Leslie Rodriguez Kritzer. Check out this preview. Okay, so this is the top of the show. I don't even have my makeup on well, yet. You know I just what? got my wig on. I'm not going to be able to talk because I need to have these headphones on. And That's it. To start. So this is how you start the show every night. I'm watching John on the monitor there. Yes. We see those, unex those unexpected people. So it's quiet down here. You see how quiet this is? The rest of the orchestra is in the pit. And he's by himself in here. Percussion is on the other side of that door.
that's going to do it for us. But for tickets, or if you want to check out extended cuts of all these interviews, head over to Broadway.com. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.